There is nothing worth living for unless it is worth dying for. My grandmother lived a life devoted to Jesus, and today her talks have been made available in their original form. So you too can be built up through the insights and mysteries God revealed to her throughout her ministry. Now, without further ado, here is Elizabeth Elliot. The title of my second talk is Quality of Life. We've been talking about how people don't know how to live, and Jesus came to give us life, and he is himself life. And I'm sure that most of you would be able to quote John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever liveth, whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And unfortunately, that term is often thought of exclusively in the quantitative sense. And I think that it is primarily qualitative. In fact, I don't think the quantity makes any difference at all to God because he is eternal. But he wants us to live a totally different quality of life. And I've been studying for quite a long time the sixth chapter of John, which contains a fascinating dialogue between Jesus and the people who wanted to argue with him, the crowd, which shows the vast gulf that is fixed between the secular mind and the spiritual mind. Jesus is trying to get across to these people that distinction between temporal and eternal, qualitative kind of life. So Jesus had just fed the 5,000, and if you want to have the reference of what I'm going to be talking about, it begins in John 6:25 and goes to the end of the chapter. I won't be trying to crawl through verse by verse in this little amount of time that we have, but when they found him on the other side of the lake, he had gone... Uh, to the other side of the lake after he had fed the 5,000. And when once the crowd realized that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and went to Capernaum in search of Jesus. And when they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. You are looking for me not because you saw miraculous signs, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. And that, I think, typifies most of the crowds that followed Jesus. They were not looking for spiritual food. They were looking for healing or for a handout of some sort. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. They were seeking him because of what he could give, not because of who he was. But Jesus continues to give them what they need more than the, the physical food. There should be no distinction in our spiritual lives between spiritual and secular. I mean, as Christians, there shouldn't be a distinction between that which we would in the normal sense, call secular and that which is spiritual. I don't think, for example, that God is more interested in my writing a book than he is in my ironing Lars's shirts. I don't think it's more important that I do one than do the other. When the time comes to iron the shirt, I better be ironing the shirt and not sitting at the computer. When it's time to scrub the bathroom, you scrub the bathroom and Jesus said, I do always those things that please the Father. If he could say, I do always those things that please the Father, then it pleased the Father when he was walking down a dusty road, when he got so tired that he had to sit down beside a well. It pleased the Father. When he went to a village wedding, why would the Son of Man go to a village wedding? Just a little social event. Well, because 
he was a man because he loved people, because he wanted to be with them. I don't think, and you can argue with me about this, but I don't think Jesus went to the village wedding in order to turn water into wine. He went to the village wedding, and when it turned out that the wine ran out and the poor host was embarrassed, Jesus turned the water into wine because it just happened to be the need at the moment. He did always those things that please the Father. But a worldly mind is totally preoccupied with worldly things. Every now and then they might try to think about something spiritual, and that can be anything. We get terribly vague when we start talking about spiritual things. But for a Christian, everything is spiritual work. We have had a succession of young men students from this august institution living in our home. We always have a seminary student living with us. And it's interesting to see the way they look at their work. We give them a single-spaced, full typewritten page of their responsibilities when they apply for the job. And they are to study that very carefully and decide whether they want to do this or not and most of them have accepted the job with practically no evidence that they had ever read what was on the paper. <laughs> In fact, um, one young man, when I had corrected him a couple of times about something that he should have done or had done wrong, uh, he said, but I didn't know I was supposed to do that. And I said, well, it was on the sheet. And he said, what sheet? <laughs> and I said, do you remember the sheet describing the job that you were going to be doing here that I gave you at the beginning. And he said, oh, was I supposed to read that? I mean, this is a seminary student. And we had one young man apply for the job who had a master's degree from MIT. And when we sat and talked about what we were expecting of him if he came to our house, because it's they work instead of pay us rent. They don't have to pay anything for the room, and they have a nice room and a private bath and a free parking place and all that, but they have to work X number of hours per week. And so when we described the fact that he was going to have to dust and vacuum and clean bathrooms and wash cars and shovel snow and all the rest of it, he seemed a little bit vague. And I said, now, do you understand? I said, you have a master's degree from Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Do you understand that we are asking you to be a servant? In fact, we're asking you to be a slave. In other words, to be at our orders. And he said yes. And I mean, he really was a very fine young man, and he did the job, and he stayed with us. But I just wanted to make sure that a man with that kind of a degree was willing to get down and scrub a floor. Now, that they haven't, we've found very few that have any idea how <laughs> to dust a room. I mean, how, why is it? that you can't just say to somebody, clean this room. The word clean means nothing. <laughs> Dust the room. Even if you have to say, I want you to vacuum the floors and mop the, the wood floors and dust the furniture, you still have to show them you dust the rungs of the chairs and all the rest of it. But one young man, and the only reason I've gone through all this rigmarole is to tell you that one young man had an argument with my husband because my husband was very upset with his carelessness and his irresponsibility. And there was never a time when we could give him a job to do and know that the job would be done when we needed it to be done. He always had an exam, a paper, uh, somebody he had to see, he had a speaking engagement, I mean, he was all over doing the work of the Lord. And the seminary work came first, and we're very flexible about our students' schedules, and, you know, we make exceptions when there are exams and that sort of thing. But this young man was hopeless. And so Lars was giving him about the 10th lecture on the subject and mentioned to him, he said, you know, we've never had a student who did as much spiritual talking as you do, nor have we ever had one so irresponsible. And he said, sir, I am offended. He said, how I dust the living room has nothing to do with my spiritual life. Well, that man was headed for trouble, and he was going into the ministry. And it does break our hearts to think that people are that secularly minded, worldly minded, 
Jesus did always those things that please the Father. What kind of carpentry work do you think he did if he did carpentry work, which we assume he must have for the first 30 years? I imagine it was perfectly done. I imagine it was faithfully done. I imagine it was thoroughly done because he would never have done anything in a sloppy manner. Well, I, you probably, those of you that listened to me on the radio have heard me talk about this a hundred times and may have heard about the boarding school that I went to in Florida where our teacher, our headmistress, would say to us almost every day, don't go around with a Bible under your arm if you didn't sweep under the bed. We had room inspection, we had rugs in our rooms, and we had to sweep with a broom. There were no vacuum cleaners provided. And there was room inspection every day. So if you swept that rug, the dust very easily went under the bed. And She didn't want any spiritual talk coming out of a messy room. So Jesus is talking about, he's trying to get these people to get their minds up from just material things. What is it you want from me? Well, you just gave out bread and fish. What are you going to give out this time? So in verse 27, he says, Stop working for temporal things. Seek spiritual things, food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. On him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. We are physical bodies. Physical bodies are, souls are attached to physical bodies. Somebody sent Amy Carmichael a check and said that he wanted it to be used for spiritual work. And Amy Carmichael returned the check, and she said, right now our greatest need happens to be a building because we cannot leave bodies lying around out in the open. And in our experience, spirits are more or less firmly attached to bodies. <laughs> so she didn't have anything that he would call spiritual work that his money could be used for. So when he says, when Jesus says, seek eternal life, food that endures for eternal life, then they said, but what must we do to do the works God requires? And Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. Do not work for food that spoils but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. Contrast between what they were chasing after and what the Son of Man was waiting to give them. Well, then their minds are still down on the earth and say, what must we do to do the works God requires? And Jesus gives them a very strange answer. The work of God is to believe. That word believe didn't interest them in the least. So they said, what miraculous sign then will you give that we may see it and believe in you? They haven't gotten point one. What will you do? Our forefathers ate manna in the desert, as is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Now what can you do? Can you top that? Can you upgrade, upstage what Moses did in the wilderness. Show us. Let's have a miracle. Can you perform as well as Mo Moses? So their minds were pragmatic. Does it work? If it's visible and demonstrable and tangible, we'll take it. But don't give us this believe stuff. We're trying to get down to what you can, sh what you can deliver. Evidence, proof, goods earthbound minds and there's an awful lot of pragmatism in Christian thinking if it works it's great if you get numbers you're doing the right thing if God supplies the money then it must be the will of God that you're doing pragmatism secular thinking so when they've brought up the subject of Moses, Jesus says in verse 32, I tell you the truth, it is not Moses who has given you bread from heaven. It is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven 
and gives life to the world. They're saying, what will you do? And he says, the bread of God is. They say, what works can we do? And he says, believe. Drag, trying everything he can muster to drag their minds away from this materialism. The bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. He wants to give you not just one meal, but bread from heaven. That bread is here, now, in living flesh, talking to you. He who came down from heaven. This is the bread. Have they understood it? Not at all. Verse 34, okay, let's have it. From now on, give us this bread. Just like when the woman at the well, when Jesus said, if you knew who it is that's talking with you, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. And she said, oh, give me this water so I don't have to come to the well anymore. Okay, let's have it, they say. Show us. Where is it? It's not it. It's he. Back to what we were talking about in the first talk. This incredible yacht, what does it do for you? How important is it? It. It's he who gives life. The vitality that we're talking about here is found only in Jesus Christ. Verse 35, Jesus declares, it's not it, it's me. I am the bread. You must come, you must believe in me, and you haven't really come, even though you came across from Capernaum. That's what he's saying in effect. I'm reading the Elizabeth Elliot translation right there. But the New English, uh, the New International Version, I am the bread, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me, and still you do not believe. Now what do you think it means to come to Jesus? They had come from Capernaum. They're standing there talking to him. But obviously they have not come in the sense in which Jesus means it. They have not believed. I am the bread of life. And I believe that the message that God wants to get across to you and me in every experience of life it's those two words, I am. When I learned that my husband Jim was missing, the verse that God gave me was Isaiah 43, 2. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon thee, for I am the Lord thy God. You don't need to know anything else. It took five days before we knew that the men were dead. I didn't need to know anything else except that he is. Everything is under control, he's saying. I know all about the deep waters and the hot fires. When you go through them, I'll be there. Because I am the Lord thy God. And that was not the first trauma of my missionary experience. In my very first year, there had been three major blows to my faith. I believe that God was breaking me in for the death of my husband, as he always is. Nothing ever takes him by surprise. He is preparing us moment by moment, hour by hour, day by day. But when I lost my informant, the man who was murdered, the only man in the world that could do the job that needed to be done of reducing the Colorado language to writing. He was the only man that spoke Spanish and Colorado. And I needed, I didn't expect to find, but it was wonderful to find a bilingual informant. And so Macario was worth his weight in gold. And he was killed 
within just a few weeks after we started to work. And when I looked, as it were, into this abyss of mystery and said, Lord, why? All he says is, trust me, I am. And it was those two words that came to me then. All you need to know is who I am. You don't need to know what's happening or why. You just need to learn to know me. Well, it's very hard to get that across to us, isn't it? Let alone to the world. To us who do believe the word, who do seek to follow and obey. And yet there isn't a day that goes by that I don't have to be reminded in some way that my thinking is secular. I need to start thinking spiritually, Christianly. I am the bread. You must come. You must believe in me. You haven't really come, he's saying in effect. Verse 36. Oh, sorry, skipped over a few things here. Verse 34, this says, Sir, from now on, give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes will never go hungry. He who believes will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me, and still you do not believe. You've seen me. You've seen the miracle. They had seen the feeding of the 5,000. But you don't believe me. Verse 37, connected with verse 32. It is my Father who gives you the true bread. And then in verse 37, he says, All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. The bread is the Father's gift to you. You, if you come, are the Father's gift to me. And you can be assured that I will never reject God's, my Father's gift. You have got to come. See, here they are standing there talking to him, but they have not come. If you come, then you become my Father's gift to me. Now, I know that there are all sorts of theological problems and interpretations and hermeneutics and everything else in this verse 37 that could be controversial, and I'm not going to try to sort them out for you at this point. I want to come back to that verse in a minute. All that the Father gives me will come to me. It looks as though these people are not going to be able to come because the Father is not giving them to him, to Jesus. But we'll come back to that. Verse 38 he tells us about the harmony between himself and his father. The harmony of two wills. I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And we don't know at this point, but we find out in the Gethsemane scene that there was a life and death conflict, a terrible conflict of wills. And here we are up against one of those mysteries that no theologian will ever unpack and unravel for us. But the mystery of the struggle of his humanity with the will of the Father. But he had already made up his mind before he came that he had come for one purpose, which was to do the will of the Father. And what's your purpose in life? Very often young people ask me for help on discovering the guidance of God. What does God want me to do? And usually the first question I ask them is, what do you want more than anything else in the world? Usually their eyes kind of glaze and their minds go blank and they don't, they sort of blink and they look at me and, um, well, I mean like, you know, wow. Um, <laughs> And I say, well, if you've made up your mind that you really want to do the will of God, then I think I can help you. If you haven't made up your mind about that, I don't think I can help you. I can help you to find the will of God if that's what you want. But how can I know whether I want it if I don't know what the will of God is? Well, that's where faith comes in. You're not going to know what the will of God is for your life. 
How do you discover the will of God for your life? You don't. You commit yourself. How do you discover what's going to happen in a marriage? You don't. You walk down the aisle and you commit yourself. You have no idea what you're getting in that package. Surprise package. <laughs> My, the bread is the Father's gift to you. You, if you come, is his gift to me. There is complete harmony, he says, between my father and me. I have come not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And I can imagine them standing there looking totally blank, not knowing who sent him. Verse 39. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all that he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. This is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all that he has given me, but raise them up in the last day. It is the purpose of the Son always to receive what the Father gives and nothing else. And I want to learn that lesson myself to be willing and ready instantly to receive what the Father gives me. Nothing more, nothing less, and nothing else. Verse 40, For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. The will of the Father is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life. And Jesus is going to be the one who raises them. Well, at this, the Jews began to grumble about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They have absolutely no idea what he's talking about. And they said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can you now say, I came down from heaven? Who is this guy? We know him. We know his parents. What does he think he's talking about? He never came down from heaven. Earthbound. And Jesus says, stop grumbling among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the father draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, they will all be taught of God. Everyone who listens to the Father and learns from him comes to me. Now this is where I want to go back to that verse in verse, uh, the one in verse 37 where it says, all that the Father gives me will come to me. Everyone who listens to the Father and learns from him comes to me. I think we need to connect those two statements in order to understand what Jesus is really saying. Now, they were standing there face to face with the manifestation of the Father. But they had not believed. They had not come. They were not prepared to submit themselves to his authority and truth. Everyone who listens to the Father and learns from him comes to me. In the sense in which Jesus is trying to get these people to see. The sense in which he's, as it were, begging them to come. To recognize who he is. And I think there's a lot of misunderstanding among Christians about what salvation means, because we're, we've been told so simply, all you need to do is come to Jesus. Not, he's knocking on the door, open your heart's door, Jesus comes in. Once he comes in, that's it. You've got eternal life. You're going to live forever. It's a free ticket to heaven. Now, I'm not contradicting that, but I am raising the question, is that really what Jesus is talking about? As I see it, nobody comes who is not prepared to obey. It is coming in the sense that Jesus is talking about, which means putting ourselves under his authority 
and under his lordship. And unless we are prepared to do that, he said, why do you call me Lord and do not the things that I say? Don't call me Lord unless you're prepared to do what I say. And these people had no more intention of doing what he said. He was just the carpenter's son. A prophet is not without honor save in his own country. Who is this guy? What makes him say he came down from heaven? We know where he came from. Everyone who listens to the Father, if they had listened with a willingness to understand and a heart to obey, they would have heard the Father's voice. And they would have come. They were not willing to listen. They were not willing to learn. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only he has seen the Father. And I can imagine they were baffled again because he was speaking in the third person about himself. You can't see the Father, but you're talking to the one who has seen the Father. And I'm telling you the truth. And I want you to start thinking spiritually on an, another level altogether. The condition for coming to the Father is the willingness to listen and to learn. Then you will be drawn by the Father to the Son. They were not listening. They were not learning. And spiritual things can be learned only by obedience. I have had, I've heard so many people say, well, how, how do you learn this stuff? How do you grow in grace? How can I learn to know God? I read my Bible every day, but I don't, I don't get the stuff you get out of it. Well, I don't know any answer at all to the question of how to know God, how to grow in grace, how to understand what Jesus is saying, except that word obedience. Obedience. There are many things that can never be understood except by obedience. Now, there are very simple, um, ordinary illustrations of that. How did you learn to swim? You could not understand how swimming works until you got into the water and did what the person told you to do. I remember taking swimming lessons in the town pool with a bunch of kids when I was about, I don't know, six years old, I guess. And the first thing we had to do was put our face in the water. Well, you can't put your face in the water because you can't breathe. But you do it, and you do it exactly the way the coach tells you, and you find out that you can put your face in the water. And that's the first thing you have to learn before you're going to learn to swim. You're not going to swim very well or very far if you can't put your face in the water. And the coach stands there and tells you the water will hold you up. Well, the water doesn't hold you up. It's, you sink. You fall to the bottom. You have to relax. You have to relax. You have to believe that the water is going to hold you up. You can't be in a knot like this and not sink to the bottom. How do you learn how to knead bread? I've seen pictures in books and I've read descriptions, but the easiest way is just to do what you see somebody else do. And Jesus is telling them, you cannot learn, you will not understand my words, you cannot come to the Father without listening, without hearing, and hearing means obeying. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear in the sense of obedience. So the condition for coming to the Father is listening, learning. And as you listen and learn and do, which is implied in both the listening, I mean, if your child listens to your instructions in the way that one guy did who hadn't even read the sheet, it's in one ear and out the other. He didn't listen. He heard it, but he didn't listen. Or you could say he listened to it and he didn't hear me. And that, I think, is what Jesus is saying here. You will be drawn. My Father will draw you. He's not going to invade your life. He's not going to insist on your doing 
this or that. He is drawing you as you listen to me, as you learn from me. And as you listen and learn, then you will be drawn by the Father to the Son. And in verse 46, he's saying, I am the only one who sees the Father. But you could hear if you wanted to. You could hear if you would. Do you listen to God? Do you race through a passage of scripture and grab up a devotional book and parrot off a few prayers and race off to work and think, I don't really get much out of that quiet time, that devotional time that everybody's always telling me I've got to have. I mean, it really doesn't do anything for me. I am the one who sees the Father, but you could hear if you would. Eternal life is a qualitative thing. It is not quantitative. You have it the moment you believe. But believing means obedience. Listening, coming, hearing, believing. None of them mean anything without obedience. You've got to do what I say. And then in verse, verses 48 to 51, he speaks about that bread. Let me start with 47. I tell you the truth, he who believes has everlasting life. And that is not merely parroting off a few words. I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. He who believes in the sense of actually doing the thing. You've heard the old illustration probably of the tightrope walker. It's a true story, I believe, that a, a tightrope was strung across Niagara Falls and the tightrope walker walked across there. Well, then he took a wheelbarrow and he said to a man standing by, do you believe that I can walk across here with a wheelbarrow? And the man said, yes, and he said, get in. He would not really believe it unless he had the faith to do it. So Jesus is telling them, he who believes has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers, your forefathers ate the man in the desert, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which a man may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. He is saying, you must feed on me. Now, bread is a wonderful sacrament, isn't it? A sacrament is a visible sign of an invisible reality. And all Christians understand the bread and the wine as being visible signs of the invisible reality of the body and blood of the Lord Jesus. But to me, all of life is sacramental in that everything I see in God's creation is a visible sign of an invisible reality. The majesty of God, the glory of God, the love of God, the exquisite particularity of his care. These are visible signs of invisible realities. When you put your money in the offering plate on a Sunday, that ought to be a token a sign of the reality of the fact that everything you have belongs to God. This is just a visible sign that you stick there. Well, I don't want to make sacramentalists out of all of you if that word scares you, but let's think about the sacrament of just ordinary bread. It is a visible sign of the principle which we're talking about today. Life comes out of death. There would not be a loaf of bread there if there hadn't been a kernel of wheat that fell into the ground and died. Except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. The fields of waving golden grain testify to the vitality of the crucified life, the life that falls into the ground, into the darkness, into nothingness, and dies. And what happens? Out of it comes this glorious sacrament, this glorious illustration of life coming out of death. 
So that first of all, there has to be the death of the kernel, then there has to be the harvest. So all this wheat has to be cut down. That's another death. And then it goes to the mill where it is crushed and ground. Yet another death. And finally, it's, well not finally, the next step, it has to be baked. And it goes into the fire. Death again. And then the beautiful crusty brown loaf of bread is put on the table and what happens? It gets eaten. (laughs) And we live because of those five previous deaths. Nothing on the table except eggs and milk, I can't think of anything else offhand, is there without death having taken place. Everything we live on has to die in order for us to live. In order for my daughter to give birth to her little seventh child in January, she had to go down to the very gates of death, and that was the first time in my life that I had been with my daughter at that moment. It is death. A mother puts her life on the line. Well, that's the principle we're talking about here. Jesus said, you must feed on me. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son and drink his blood, you have no life. What's wrong with the world? There's no life. And what is wrong with the world can never be fixed without a cross. What's wrong with you and me can never be fixed without the crucifixion. Jesus went through the process. Death over and over and over again. Death to himself when he left the ivory palaces and came into this world of woe. Only his great eternal love made my Savior go. It was death for those three years. Dying to himself in order that he might give life to the multitudes. Crushing, grinding, eating. The process, he goes through it still. He says, I am the living bread. I am alive. I am vital. I am energizing. I am life-giving. But you are going to have to die to yourself if you're going to live, if you're going to hear me. You've got to give up all these secular notions of yours. That's not what I'm talking about. Leave it behind and listen to me. And the Jews, utterly obtuse, in verse 52 began to argue sharply among themselves, how can this man give give us flesh to eat, give us his flesh to eat? And that is a dangerous and an unnecessary question that we are always asking God. How are you going to do this, Lord? We pray desperately for a job or for money or for some miracle to happen in somebody that we love. And after we've prayed, then we just say, now, Lord, I just don't see how you're going to do this. And it's none of our business. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man. He doesn't give give them any explanations whatsoever. He does not give them an answer to how. He says, unless you do. Unless you do, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, You have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. And whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father. You must continually live on, depend on, feed on, live your life in, remain in me and I in you. The source of my life is my Father. The source of your life is me, he's saying. And he refers again to the manna. Your forefathers ate manna and died, but he who feeds on this bread will live forever. Manna was the only thing there was to eat in the wilderness. There was no other bread. They ate it and lived for a while. There is no other spiritual food except me, Jesus says. Do you want to live? Do you want spiritual food? Do you want vitality? You must eat living bread. 
To come to Jesus is to bring your whole self, all that you are, all that you have, all that you do, your mind, your emotions, your reason, your intellect, everything to him, lay it all before him, and say as Paul did, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? Not how or why or what the consequences will be, but to see it as a personal imperative, a categorical imperative. Jesus it addresses us with duty. Something to be done at once. My husband and I had dinner the other night with a couple who gave us their thrilling testimony of amazing grace. And he told us how when he came to God, a mean, selfish, avaricious, greedy, very wealthy businessman, he said, God said to me, go home and love your wife. Go home and love your wife. We'll never understand without obedience. I pray you've been encouraged and inspired by what you've heard today. And we'll keep joining us here and on social media for my granny's inspiration. Until then, remember, the eternal God is your refuge and underneath are the everlasting arms. <laughs>